Hey guys, it's a seed starting season. So let's go over some things that you should be thinking about when you're going to start your seeds for the garden for next year. The first thing we want to look at is what are the systems in nature that cause seeds to germinate and then we want to mimic and replicate those. So what are the soils that seeds will germinate in and what are the light conditions and water conditions that soils will germinate in. Now just quickly forgive me for the shakiness of the videos. Uh, my, my gimbal stabilizer broke. I'm looking to replace it, so sorry about that uh, if these are a little bit shaky. Um, so seeds will germinate kind of underneath trees on the forest floor of the canopy um, of the system that they're in. Obviously grasslands will germinate, grassland seed loving species will germinate in grassland environments and tree based fungal dominated soil uh, seeds uh, will germinate in those. So. Typically, the thing that's in common with all of them is going to be a dappled sun style of lighting. So underneath this uh, Russian olive tree, this is a nitrogen-fixing, chop-and-drop, sacrificial species for my uh, apple tree here. Uh, and it has service berries and asparagus and stuff planted all in and around it that is dormant right now. Um, this is a, a hazelbert bush. I believe it might be a service berry. Um, can't quite remember. But trees, seeds are going to germinate inside uh, the leaves here. Inside dappled shade covered by the, uh, the filtered light that's getting through the leaves of the bushes. And it's going to be inside dappled shade of grasses and leaves uh, down on the soil. So when we are thinking about what kind of environment we want our seeds to go in, we want to try to replicate that. I'm going to do a seed saving uh, video down the road. This is my seed collection that I've just kind of started. Um, these are both seeds that I've purchased before as well as handfuls, um, tons and tons of seeds that I collect and save to get my own genetics. Um, essentially, seeds themselves will have all of the nutrient that it needs inside the seed. And the soils of the seeds aren't gonna need um, any nutrients, at least at the beginning stage of the plant. So we have a whole bunch of seeds in here. Each one of these seeds has everything that it needs in order to get established and get up to at least until it has its first leaf set. This is perennial kale here. Um, the size of this plant is absolutely incredible when it gets established and you saw the size of the seed. It, it has uh, very very small seeds. It needs very little energy to get established. Uh, so for your start to start your seeds you're not going to need to supply any nutrient uh, at the beginning. So like all uh, living organisms, most things need water, food, air, something to breathe. Plants also need sun um, above ground for photosynthesis. Now for starting seeds, um, like we already said, all the nutrients are there inside the seed. It has everything that it needs. So the food aspect is covered. Uh, so we need to talk, think about water and oxygen. Those are the two main things that we're going to uh, think about when we're starting seeds. Once the seed gets up, then we can think about light. Um, dappled light for the beginning, but we'll think about light more later. So focusing on water and oxygen. Um, these two things are why seeds need to be babied. 
And the reason why is that um, they kind of compete against each other. So when you have water that's pooling and just sitting stagnant, uh, the oxygen in the water is going to off gas and uh, stagnant sitting water is going to go anaerobic with no oxygen. Now, um, trees and plants do photosynthesis, but like I say in other videos, actually the roots of the trees do respiration and they can drown um, and suffocate just like animals can if they're in oxygen depleted environments. So when we're starting our seeds, if we just fill something up with uh, water and the plant roots are sitting in standing water, they're actually suffocating because they're not getting any oxygen. At the same time, if the plant dries out, it's going to die of thirst. And seeds, especially with very tiny little baby roots and a tiny weak little plant, you know, it's like the newborn baby. Um, it's very susceptible to dying to any of these things. And that's why we have to baby plants. Now, um, we want to keep the plant uh, hydrated, so we want to solve its thirst problems, but we also don't want to drown it. And those are the two main uh, areas that we have to think about when we're going to think about what kind of soil are we going to grow our plant in. We don't necessarily need to have the food aspect covered right away, because like I said, the seed has everything it needs. But we need to think about wet, moist, but not too wet. So we want water storage capability, but we also want drainage. Those are the two things that you need to think about with your seed starting mix. And when we understand these things, now we can actually go and design our own seed starting mixes based on things that we have in and around us that we can get for free. The last thing that they need, uh, they're going to need temperature. So many seeds have a couple different temperature triggers in order to get germination going. And those are also going to be largely based on wherever they evolve from, wherever they're native to. So for example, something like a tomato, it's going to need a fairly warm temperature to trigger germination. And this isn't a black and white thing. So as the temperature gets warmer and warmer, closer up to say 80 degrees Fahrenheit, then you'll get a higher germination rate um, and a, a shorter germination time for your tomato seeds. Typically, most seeds are going to want to germinate somewhere in the 65 to 80 Fahrenheit range. And as you go from 65 and up towards 80, you'll just find that um, instead of having a 10 days until they germinate, it'll go to 8 days, to 6 days, to 4 days, that sort of thing. Cold stratification means that the seed will need a certain number of days below a certain temperature in order to say, hey, winter has fully come and gone, and now I actually think it's spring, and I'm going to go ahead and germinate. You can kind of think of this as like a long ticking timer on a bomb um, that's going to sit there and slowly burn the wick away and only then will you be able to trigger germination. So for something like, let's just say a Siberian pea shrub, if you want to germinate a Siberian pea shrub seed, uh, you're going to actually need a lot of days of cold stratification at very low temperatures in order to trick the seed into thinking winter's over, spring is here, and I can safely germinate. So depending on what you're growing, look up cold stratification, look up uh, chill hours. Chill hours is more to do with blooming on plants than uh, seed starting. So cold stratification is more what you want to look at for starting seeds. Uh, but look to see if you can meet those conditions. If you can't meet them uh, with your natural habitat by, say, spreading seeds in the fall, then you might have to artificially simulate them in your fridge uh, before you sow them in a starter kit. So you might have to artificially start those seeds um, and you know simulate that in the fridge before you're going to get successful germination. But temperature, temperature is a big germinating trigger for seeds, and it's one of the things that we're going to need to look at. So now let's look at soils. Um, so this is a seed starting mix right here that I use um, in my um, seed starts. Uh, this, I, I bought this bag uh, before I kind of read about how devastating peat moss is. 
Uh, I wouldn't use this anymore because I'm just really, really against using peat. Um, it's a really uh, ecologically and environmentally damaging harvesting technique. Um, and it takes 2,000 years to regrow the peat bog. So I don't like to support peat. Um, but while I have this bag, I'm going to go through it and I'm going to use it. Because I think not using it would be a bigger waste. Um, so this... This is actually kind of the perfect seed starting mix. And the reason why is that this mix is 50% perlite and 50% peat. So when I said before about starting seeds, um, what you really want to do is you want to get moisture capability and retention. And that's where the peat comes in. And then you want to get drainage. And you want to, you want to have the water drain out of the system if possible. That's where the perlite comes in. So a 50-50 mix of peat and perlite is a great starter for plants because even though the peat and perlite have no nutrients in it, like I said, the seeds and the plants don't need any nutrients. They have everything they need at least until they get repotted after their first set of true leaves. So this is the perfect seed starting mix in order to start seeds. You can do other things as long as you have as long as you have the ability to drain soil and retain soil in moisture and hold it inside something where it's not, the roots aren't sitting in the moisture, but the water is accessible to the roots. So uh, for the water retention capabilities, that can be compost, it can be whatever you want. Now, um, if you want to bring compost inside, you're going to have to understand that there's going to be eggs of tons of insects in there. There's going to be, uh, you know, fungal and soil diseases in there and they can attack your plants. So if you're going to bring compost, it should be finished compost, well-finished compost. And then if you want to treat it by sticking it in the oven or putting it on a fire where it's going to get above, you know, 180 Fahrenheit to kill everything in it and kind of sterilize it, um, then you probably want to go ahead and do that because you don't want to hatch a bunch of aphid eggs or something like that inside your house. Uh, we can design systems in nature in our final planting location to deal with that stuff in a natural way but in your basement you don't have an ecosystem in your basement so you don't want to have a bunch of aphids or whatever it is hatching inside your basement grow area um, so as much as i'm an advocate for growing in live systems starting seeds is actually best done in sterile systems so it's one of the you know only areas that i really do move away from you know the uh starting in sterile system or starting in and growing in live systems if possible now for anything that you can sow and start in situ uh in your in the final garden bed location then that's better just do it there uh, for me in canada uh, you know if i want to grow tomatoes i have to start them because i just won't get tomatoes in time if i wait until June 1st and then plant my tomatoes starting there. I need to get a good solid six or eight weeks ahead and start them early and that way I can really maximize my harvest. So uh, for seeds that I start, I like to grow them in sterile environments uh, at least at the beginning until they get their first set of true leaves. So here's my setup uh, in terms of light. Um, I have a heat mat that I purchased. This is the heat mat here. It's a jump start seedling heat mat. Um, and this will heat the seeds up to trigger germination uh, perfectly. And then once the seeds come up, um, this is my grow light here. I want to actually get a second one because I found that uh, the plants on the edges, I wasn't using all my space ideally, the plants on the edges were kind of reaching towards the grow light. Uh, so I actually want to get two of these in here for the same spot. And then I just put tinfoil around to try to reflect as much light as possible back in. And then I have it on this, you know, rope system where I can drop, I can drop this uh, grow light right down. So once the plants grow, it's almost like they're in the grassland and they, they reached up over top of the uh, grasses and if you don't bring the light down close to them, they're going to reach up and get spindly and long and weak. So as soon as the plants grow up, you want this plant to be um, very, very close to the light. You want it to be uh, inches away from the light 
and then be able to adjust it as the, as the plants grow so that they don't have to reach too hard and they can grow thick, strong roots. So having an ability to raise or lower your light is perfect. If you have um, LED lights that aren't going to burn your plants, that's even better. And uh, if you're growing on, you know, some kind of incandescent lamp bulbs, just be aware that it's going to put out a bunch of heat and you might burn some of your plants. Um, so just try to watch for signs of burn damage and stay just above that height. Uh, but you do want that light nice and low. So now let's talk about how we water the plants. Um, when the seeds are really young, you have to water from above because they don't have roots to drive right down um, this big, uh, sorry for the low light conditions here, uh, to go right down all the way to the bottom of these seed start uh, trays. They're only going to have roots at the top surface of these things. So you have to, you know, really baby the seeds and sprinkle them with a gent gentle layer of, of, you know, sprayed aerosoled water and just keep the, the surface wet. Now, the thing that's going to kill the seeds is at the beginning age is either the seeds drying out or the seeds staying too wet and molds developing and molds will kill a seed faster than anything else. So while you're trying to keep them wet, you have to baby them and you want to just keep them moist. And then once in a while, you're actually going to want to have the thing dry out completely and you're going to want to kill off any molds that are growing and accumulating in your uh, in and around your seeds because they'll actually kill your seed. So ideally at a time when you're at home, then you can um, let it go completely dry where it's not going to stay dry for too, too long, maybe just an hour, two hours, couple hours, and then you can rewater them and re-soak. Um, just to keep that moil, the mold from, you just want to really wipe that mold out and stop the mold from killing your seeds. But you do want to keep them moist. You want them not to dry out too much. And then um, you want them not getting too soaking wet and standing water. Now, after the seeds are up and after they have their first set of true leaves um, and you bring the light down and you get all that set up, uh, now you you want to stop watering from the top and you actually want to water from the bottom. So what I do is I put all my seed trays in a, a container like this um, and this has no drain holes. These have drain holes at the bottom and the water can get out through the drain holes. I don't know if you can see it too well, um, but then the water can sit and pool in here. And then what I'll do is I'll just remove, I'll remove one of the the seed trays in here, I'll pull it out and then I'll water this and I'll fill it up until, you know, it's a couple inches above the bottom of those other uh, seed trays. And then I'll put the, I'll put the thing back in and then the plants will wick up the moisture from the bottom as they need it. Now, if I just leave this in, the water in there for a couple of days, it'll turn anaerobic. So I actually want to um, pull that water out you know, once a day and refill it with fresh oxygenated water. Uh, the last thing uh, when talking about watering is maybe once a week, I want to do a hard flush. So once I said, don't water from the top, but at the same time, once a week, I do a hard flush and I water entirely from the top and I flood it. So what I'll do is I'll actually take the tray out. I'll put it under the sink and I'll just flood and flush the water through the soil and I'll let it run like that um, until, you know, for maybe 30 seconds or a minute of just constant flushing water through that soil. And what that's going to do is it's going to pull all it's going to pull all the diseases and anything that's building up that I don't like all the salts from anything, you know, in any kind of fertilizer sprays. If you do add fertilizer sprays and uh, plant feed. The salts in those sprays, it's important that we flush them out. So it'll pull it down and flush them out through the soil and keep them from building up around the plants. So once a week, I recommend to do a big, hard, strong flush and flush that water through the plants. But then for the most part, we're watering from the bottom and we're letting the plants wick up whatever they choose that they need for moisture. That way we're not guessing how much water to apply. We're just letting them do it on their own. Now, once the plant gets up above uh, its uh, first set of true leaves, the seed is out of energy. So now we actually need to feed it. 
So um, all the watering recommendations that I said below, we, we're going to keep doing it in the, this new system, but we're also going to pot up. We're going to take advantage of the fact that we need to now move from uh, a sterile soil and we're going to have to move into something that has some nutrients in it. Uh, so, and we're also going to take advantage of the fact that um, these tiny little seed trays, the plant's going to start getting root bound inside of those. So we need to give it more room and we also need to feed it. So it's a good time to pot up. So potting up means we're going to take one of these cells. We're going to take one of the cells of these seed uh, starting trays. And we're going to put each one into something big like, you know, a beer cup. So we're going to drill holes in the bottom of the beer cup for drainage. And then we're going to put in um, a mix of what I like to do is um, a mix of compost and sand. So the sand for the drainage and the compost for water retention and nutrient. Now I'll bake my compost because I, I want, you know, a sterile environment inside my house. There will be enough nutrient inside the soil to make it last. It won't be sustainable without the soil life. The soil life will make those nutrients bioavailable to the plant. But for now, um, just you know, for a month or so, the compost will have plenty of nutrient for the plant um, to survive until we can get it out in its final planting location. So we'll plant it in these uh, potting plants. Uh, if you're doing tomatoes, you actually want to bury the tomato as far down as possible. So you want to pull up all the stems on the tomato, leave a couple at the top, and then uh, plant them in the pot uh, very, very low, and the adventitious roots of the stem will root all throughout the pot. I'll do an a entire video on tomatoes because I have a bunch of tricks that I use to plant my tomatoes, including um, planting them in trenches sideways, and getting, you know, a good solid two, three f feet of root mass established right from day one. Um, and it just works unbelievable. So I'll show you that in another video. But in general, we're going to be up planting, up potting our plants now. And we're going to need to th start thinking about food. So for me, that's compost. I'm going to mix that with sand, like play sand that you get from Home Depot. That's just totally fine. So half sand, half compost. Um, and uh, if you want to do a potting mix, that's fine as well. You might need to add some kind of, you know, uh, fertilizer feed for your plants. You know, I kind of like to move away from fertilizers if possible, but that is always an option um, if that's the way you want to go. But at this point, we got to go up to pots. Now, uh, one last thing that I want to mention before I go on is what do you think happens when we take all of these, you know, uh, plants in here and turn them into a bunch of big cups. We're going to run out of space real fast. And this is, I think, one of the main things that most new gardeners do and make a mistake on. So the next thing you know, you have, you know, potted plants on all your windows here. And all the windowsills in your house have potted plants on them. So, um, what you have to really think about is how much space do you have? Um, one of those little trays has 72 plants in it. And how many plants do you really need? This is, I think, the thing that most new gardeners do, and I certainly am very guilty of this, is I started way too many plants, way too many. I had 70-ish tomatoes alone, and I ended up giving half of them, more than half of them away. I kept around 20 for myself, and I gave away the other 50. And my house was a disaster, like potted plants everywhere on every windowsill. Uh, my wife was going crazy. Uh, I was driving her nuts to have all this stuff everywhere. Um, the house looked kind of messy. Um, and I didn't need that many plants. So this year I'm going to scale back, a, you know, a little bit. Um, I'm also moving towards perennials. So my actual seed starts are getting less and less, even though I'm still expanding my garden. I'm doing more propagation by cuttings and that sort of stuff. Um, but something like tomatoes, I'm always going to want tomatoes. So uh, I'm always going to be stuck having to start some seed. Uh, I don't have a greenhouse yet. One day, I'd love it. Um, but for now, um, when you pot that up from that tiny little tray into one of those big pots, you're going to quickly run out of space. You're going to quickly run out of light space uh, with your grow lights, and you're going to be trying to find windowsills everywhere. And the windowsills won't have as much light as they need usually. 
Um, so the plants are going to end up long and spindly and all that sort of stuff. So I would just suggest whatever you think you're going to need to grow, cut back on it a little bit, figure out how many you actually need during this first year. Um, and then, you know, adjust the next year, but start out a little smaller, manageable, uh, set it up so that when you take those trays and split them out into the bigger pots, that the volume that those pots uh, take up, you can still have enough plants under grow lights and it'll be sustainable. Uh, that way you can, you know, go the whole way until you, you're putting those plants in the garden. All right, so don't overdo it uh, with the amount of plants that you start. Okay, so let's summarize with a nice booch. Okay, so we talked about a couple things. Um, light, oxygen, water, um, and nutrient food. So let's talk about light. Filtered light at the beginning. Um, it won't need too much light in order to germinate. It's mostly going to be heat driven. So we want temperatures in the range 65 to 80. Uh, you're going to look, want to look at cold stratification. How much do you need? How much cold stratification hours do you need and at what temperature? Um, and then uh, you want to have it under a heat mat when you're going to ideally go to germinate it. As close to 80 as possible, that'll be the fastest germination. Once the plant comes up and it has its first two leaves, then you want to bring that light right down to the plant so that um, it, the plant doesn't have to stretch and get all leggy in a week. Okay, you want that plant, that light right down and you want to have a way to either raise the light or raise the plant uh, with a fixed light in order to, or sorry, lower the plant uh, in order to keep, you know, the, the top leaves just without, uh, close enough to the light that they don't have to stretch, but far enough away that they don't get burned. So then uh, oxygen. Oxygen is going to be needed by the plant roots at the bottom and we want to avoid standing water. That's pretty much all we have to worry about that. Uh, we also want the soils to dry out to prevent molds. We want to trigger a dry out once in a while in order to kill any molds that are accumulating. Uh, but we don't want to dry it out for too long in order to kill the plant and the seed itself while it's fragile. Water kind of just talked about it, uh, but we want seeds to be damp all the time, not sitting in water, not, uh, not wet, but also not to dry out. So at the beginning when the seed germinates, we want to spray it and water from the top. Uh, we want to keep it moist that way. We do want it to dry out once a week for about an hour just to kill the molds off. And then after the seed is up and the plant is established, we want to start watering and you know, and once the roots go down, the tray and get uh, larger we want to start watering from the bottom and we want to start wicking moisture up and then ideally uh, once a week we want to do a hard flush we want to flush the water straight down and through and this is why uh, aqua, uh, aquaculture beds like hydroponics uh, that have a bell siphon with a flood drain cycle that's why those are really really solid seed starting beds because they have that flushing action so we do want to simulate that as much as we can. We want to flush uh, as much as possible. And then, uh, so that's sun, water, for soils. Uh, the soil we want to have 50-50% water holding capability, and then we want to have it to be able to drain. So uh, we want to do something like peat and perlite. We want to do compost and sand. Um, if you do compost and sand, maybe go a little heavier on the sand side. Um, but you can think of whatever you want. You can do, you know, pea gravel that you have uh, free somewhere. And then something that's going to hold moisture. Um, rotted, chopped up leaves, coconut uh, coir, uh, anything like that is fine. As long as you have a moisture retention capability as well as a draining capability. Um, and then um, the last thing is nutrient. It, as soon as the plant gets tall enough to have its own first set of leaves, that's where the seed has kind of been expended and all of its nutrient is gone. Uh, and now you have to, the, you don't have to supply it, but somehow the plant has to be able to access new nutrient. So whether that's because you grow in compost nutrient rich soils, whether you pot it out um, and up pot it, or just put it out into the garden at that point, 
Uh, whatever you do, somehow the plant needs to be able to eat. And it's all out of food and now you've got to find a way to do that. If you do a seed starting uh, fertilizer, you know, that's fine too. Uh, I like to move away from the, you know, constant input type gardening. So uh, if I can make compost and use that in my system, that's fine. Just remember, if you do use your own compost, you really want to try to bake it and kill all the life in it uh, before you bring it in your house or you could find yourself with a bunch of aphids crawling up your walls. So, um, cheers to starting seeds. Uh, thank you for everybody who's gardening. We're saving the bees together. Uh, we are growing food locally. Every single tomato you eat that was grown on your soil in nutrient rich soil uh, not only has more nutrient in it for you uh, because it was left on the vine for longer, the ripening process is the plant putting nutrients into the food. So the longer we can keep it there, the better. So you're eating healthier food. You're not eating food that's sprayed with chemicals. Uh, and most importantly, you're not e eating food that was grown and packaged and shipped and transported and stored, uh, picked early to ripen on the truck. The whole carbon footprint that comes with packaging and storing and transport that's a lot of uh, greenhouse gases that you're saving so you're helping save the planet uh, good on you happy gardening i'll see you next time